it's time for us to check back in with Alex Stewart and see what happens next. If you've missed any of the previous readings, please look in the description below for a playlist. Alex, that this is chapter eight, Alex the doctor. I've cured people when the regular doctors failed. One day, not long after I first met him, Alex began discussing herbs and herbal remedies, and I was amazed at his vast knowledge of the subject. I hadn't realized at the time that for many years he was recognized in his community as an herb doctor. Pshaw, son, I took up doctrine and followed it for a long time. There's plenty of people around here that'll tell you I cured them when the regular doctors failed. There's a plant for every disease. If we just had sense enough to find the right ones, we'd never have to go to a doctor. Of course, you need to know when to get your herbs. If you don't get them at the right time, they ain't no account much. Now, the Indians wouldn't gather no kind of herb unless it was in full bloom. Said it had more strength then. Everything is put here for some purpose, and if people don't use it, it's their own fault. Now, you take the medicines that comes out today. I'd say two-thirds of them is just to get your money. They ain't no help to you. Back then, people didn't go off. They went to the woods and got their medicine and made it. And they wasn't near as much sickness and disease as they is today. They wasn't accused of heart trouble and things like that. Now, my medicine would get that syphilis and clap clean out of your system. Them shots they give you now just stops it, and it'll show up in your children. I's up there on the ridge a-grubbin', digging out small stumps. One time, I's by myself. I heard something and looked around, and there was the sheriff. He come on up, and we talked a while, and I was expecting him to say any time that he was there to raid me because I had a steal not far away. But after a while, he said, well, I'll just tell you my business. I come up here to see if I could get you to make some medicine, he says. There's a fella that's got the bad disease, and he's sort of ashamed and asked me to come and see if you'd make him some medicine. I says to myself, now I wonder who that other feller is. And the sheriff kept us sitting there talking, and finally I says to myself, Oh, oh, I know who that feller is that's got the bad disease, and I'm a-sitting here talking to him right now. Well, I said, you come around tomorrow late. It'll take me might nigh all day to gather in all the herbs and things and steam them down. I started in on it early the next morning, gathering my stuff, and worked on it pert near all day, and just about the time I got it strained out, here he come. Now I said, you tell that feller to drink a pint of this every day till it's gone. Eight days, it'll last him. Well, in three days, here come the sheriff back, wanting another gallon for that other feller. I says, the devil, you say, that was supposed to have lasted him a week. Well, he said, I think his old lady got it too. And they've been a drinking it, both of them. Alex laughed. Well, I said, all right, but I think I know who that feller is. He sort of grinned, and he says, For God's sake, don't never name it to nobody. Alex laughed heartily. Where did you learn to be an herb doctor? Well, a lot of my people followed making medicine. My uncle was an herb doctor, and he mostly learned it to me. He cured diseases that none of them regular doctors could cure. He could cure syphilis when all others failed. There's a woman that lived over here on Clinch River, and her family was well off. Her daddy had a big farm and a lot of stock. They was big shots. She was the proudest woman ever I seed in my life. She wouldn't hardly speak to a poor person. Well, she got the bad ailment, and she'd slip off to the doctors, but it just got worse and worse till her face got in a solid sore. Why, you couldn't see no skin at all. She was about to die, and she come to my Uncle Wits. That was Ellis's daddy. She had heard about him being such a good doctor. Old Dr. Mitchell down there had done give up on her. Said she had gone too far. She'd gone to Dr. Miller over here in Rogersville, too, but he couldn't help her. It was beneath her to come see my uncle because they were so prosperous, and Uncle Whit was just living from hand to mouth. 
but she was in such bad shape she come anyway. You could tell that she thought it was beneath her. I was at Uncle Witt's sitting on the porch, and here she come, riding a horse. The porch was pretty high, and we was sitting there, and she come right on up to the side of it. Uncle Witt never spoke, nor told her to get down, nor nothing. She commenced to talking to him, and you could tell he didn't like her, for she was mean and hateful. She said, I understand you make some good medicine, some good bitters. He said, well, I've made some. Well, she said, I come to see if you'd make me some. I've got eczema. Eczema. And the doctors can't cure it. She pretended like it wasn't nothing but eczema. By Jenny's, he said, I don't guess they can. Well, she kept on talking to him, and he was out of corn that year. Nobody had any corn to sell that year, and Uncle Witt didn't have no money, even if they'd been corn for sale. He was just about at starvation. She said, now I ain't got nothing to pay you right now, but if you'll make me that medicine, I can pay you in corn. Well, he sat there a few minutes, and he said later that it looked like his only chance to get bread to feed his family. He was up against it. He said, well, by genies, if you'll let me have some corn, I'll make you some medicine. I went out to help him gather the herbs. We first got the roots of hemp. He called it east and west. He cut them roots in little short pieces, and they was as black as they could be. The same way with mayapple roots, he got the roots of black haw, pawpaw, sarsaparilla, elecampan, polk root, elder root, and bittersweet. It took nine herbs besides the barks. Then he got some wahoo bark, some red dogwood bark, and then some hemlock leaves, and he put a handful of that in it. Then he added some wild comfort, and he said, it, it don't matter how much of that you use, for it's not poison. If you want, you can put in a little mountain tea, and that'll flavor it and keep it from tasting so bad. He knew how much of each one to put in. Just guessing at it could help once in a while, I guess, but it would be an accident. When he got it all together, it was a great big kettle full of herbs. He put in three gallons of water and built a fire under it, and he steamed it down to one gallon. It took about all day to do that. Well, he took that to her and told her how to use it. He said, now you don't eat no fat meat, don't be on no horses, and let the men alone for six weeks or longer. She said, oh, I don't have nothing to do with men, no how. Alex chuckled. Uncle Witt knowed that was a lie. Well, she took that gallon of medicine and that cured her. Her daddy was so pleased he let Uncle Witt have enough corn to feed his family all summer and wouldn't charge him nothing for it. After that, she was the best friend Uncle Witt you ever saw. She'd go to see him and stay all day, just visited with him. Alex described several instances where he cured the bad disease, but one was especially poignant. It tells much about the pathetic, desperate conditions of that era and that area and the misery which venereal disease wrought before the days of penicillin and other miracle medicines. Now there's a feller right close by, and he caught it, and he give it to his wife, and she was in a family way. He was so bad that he had to go on two canes. I was way up yonder on the top of that ridge one day plowing corn. All of a sudden, the mule stopped, and I knowed she'd seen something. I looked down the ridge, and here come that poor feller hobbling along on them canes. When he got up close, he said, I come to see if I could get you to make me some medicine. He sat down and commenced talking, and he told me he'd spent every cent he had trying to get cured, and that none of the doctors had done him any good. He said, I've gone and had shots, and by the next day, I can't tell that I ever took them. Them doctors had doctored him till he'd run out of money, and then they dropped him. Well, I says, don't get out of heart with it. I'll make you some medicine, and if you take it like you ought to, it'll cure you, son. He said, I've got a brass bedstead down at the house that I paid $25 for, and that's the only thing I've got in this world that's worth anything. I'll give you that bed for the medicine. 
He just had two bedsteads, and he had a wife and three children. I said to myself, I don't want nothing for the medicine, but I didn't say anything to him. I went and made him some medicine and took it to him and told him just how to take it. I said, now if it's too stout on your bowels, just cut down a little on it till your bowels will move about once a day. While his wife was taking it, the baby was born, and it had no eyes. It just lived a little while. After they both got well, he come up here and wanted me to go with him to get that brass bedstead. I said, you just let that bedstead set where it's at. If you want to come up here and help me work for the time I took off from plowing, that'll be pay enough. He come up and helped me work for one day. I ought to have charged him more, but I felt sorry for him. I felt more sorry for his wife, for he had no business going out and catching it in the first place. In almost any society, no matter how primitive, there develops specialization in crafts, vocations, and professions. Even the Old Testament talks of the scribes, the herdsmen, and so forth. But specialization was most difficult in the isolated frontier region of America, mainly because of the sparse and widely scattered population. There was simply not enough people in most areas to warrant a full-time blacksmith, cobbler, tanner, miller, etc. It became necessary for every family to make their own clothing, do their own blacksmithing, tan their own leather, make their own furniture, and perform a hundred other tasks, including doctoring. It's interesting to note that some specializations, starting hundreds of years ago in Europe, had made no advancement whatever on Newman's Ridge. The story Alex told me about now Mullins specializing in the treatment of scrofula is a good example. Old Nell Mullins was her name. She could lay her hand on you and say a sort of ceremony and that would cure the scrofula. She was a good looking woman, but she was rough too. She had an awful terrible big nose. Now Uncle George had a girl, her name was Mary, that had scrofula. She was all swelled up and under the jaw. A heap of people used to have that. It was a great growth under your neck, and it looked like it would have choked you to death. You don't hear tell of it anymore. Uncle George came by one day to get me to go over there on the Blackwater to see old Nell. We took the girl over there. She's about five years old, and George asked now could she do anything for it. She said to me and Uncle George, Now don't pay no attention to me. Look over there toward the ridge. She put her hand on the girl and said a few words, and directly she had her doctored. Uncle George took Mary back over there in three weeks, and that scrofula was gone. And when he took her the third time, it was plum gone. Now, you wouldn't believe what I'm telling you unless you could see it. It just looked like that thing was going to choke her to death. Did the charm doctors charge anything? No, no, I heard them say they wasn't allowed to charge, or the charm wouldn't work. Now, if you wanted to give them something, well, that was all right. Well, honesty compels me to admit I've never heard of scrofula, and I wasn't at all sure that anybody except Alex and his neighbors on Newman's Ridge had heard of such a disease. But it didn't take much research to find that scrofula is a form of tuberculosis which usually affects the lymph glands in the neck most commonly in children, causing extensive swelling, just as Alex said. What was most intriguing was the fact that scrofula was once known in England as the king's evil, since it was commonly believed that it could be cured by the king if he merely touched the victim. The practice apparently started with King Edward the Confessor, who reigned in the 11th century. It is little less than incredible that Nell Mullins, in her one-room, dirt-floored log house on Blackwater Creek, would employ the same method of curing scrofula as did this British king 900 years before. It's reasonable to assume that Nell never heard of King Edward the Confessor, or even of England. But while the practice of healing this disease by the touch or charm method had largely disappeared in the old country many years before, it had lived on in this section of the southern Appalachian Mountains. While Alex seemed to believe in her ability to heal, he did manifest some doubts. The following comments are illustrative. 
She could cure the thrush too. I've took two or three of my children over there when they's babies and she'd blow in their mouths to cure them. But I got to studying about that. It looked to me like that could be dangerous. Say she got some bad disease and blowed her breath in your mouth two or three times. You're liable to get it. I quit taking them over there. Back to your doctrine. What other kinds of illness did you treat? Oh, a heap of things. They was a boy who lived up the valley and he took pneumonia and was just about dead. He was laying there breathing as hard as he could, couldn't hold his eyes open. Dr. Trent came and looked at him and never gave him a dose of medicine. He said, there's nothing I can do for him. He just turned around and walked out. It just looked like it was impossible for that boy to live. When he did breathe, you could hear him from here down to the road yonder. He'd just get his breath every two or three minutes. Well, I said, it can't hurt him. I'm going to bathe him in liquor. I just pulled that cover down, poured that whiskey out, and commenced right there on his chest, rubbing it on him. I guess I used right out a pint on him. And it wasn't but a few minutes until he quit breathing that away. By night, he was 50% better, and by the next day, he was feeling pretty good. Coal oil, turpentine, and onion is the best thing for pneumonia there is. You take and put some onions in your fireplace and cover them with hot coals for just a little while. Let them get real soft and mushy and squeeze that juice out on a piece of flannel. Put that on the person's chest and then wet it good with coal oil and turpentine. You can put a little mutton tallow on it and that makes a kind of salve. Cover that over with another piece of flannel and I'll say that in 30 minutes they'll go to breathing easier. Whether or not this and other remedies worked as well as Alex thought they did is debatable. The fact that the patient had confidence in them may have been as beneficial as the medicine itself. Wilma Dykeman, a close friend, a noted writer, and the official Tennessee historian comments on this point. Much of the medical treatment in our mountains was practiced by those who knew as much about plants as they did about people. The herb doctors knew nature and human nature and brought the two together in ways that often effectively healed the illness of friends and neighbors. It has been said that in the main, the medicine of the mountains drew its power from the most ancient and basic magic of the physician's art, the magic of the mind. It worked because the patient thought it would work. There used to be a heap of people when I was a boy who had what they called the scald head. Did you ever hear tell of the scald head? I learned how to cure it, but by the time I got to doctrine, you never heard tell of it. The scald head? I don't think I've heard of it. What exactly is it? It's a mean disease. Your whole head gets all infected. There was an old lady that lived out there on the ridge that took the scald head and she lost every hair on her head. She got a red handkerchief and wore it around her head all the time. Never took it off. I catched her with it off a time or two and it might near killed her. She had a gang of children and they every one had the scald head. Some of them got cured, and some never did. Old Bill Mason out here, he had the scald head, and he lost all his hair. He was an awful fine feller. He got him a wig made up to wear, and it was red. He got old, and he still wore that old red wig, and he was the funniest looking thing ever you seen. Then there was Paul Croft. He's a plum good man, and he lost all of his hair that way. He wore a hat all the time. He'd go to church and sit way in the back and never pull his hat off. He's ashamed. Oh, I don't know what the people that had the scald head. Alex paused to feel and light his pipe and was silent while he puffed. Finally, he said, I ain't heard of no scald head in, I don't guess, 50 years. What was the cure for scald head? You could go on up here on the ridge and cut a gash in a pine tree and go back in a few days and have you a quart of rosin. You boil that down with beeswax and beef taller and a little camphor and turpentine and make you a grease or a salve. It'll cure any kind of sore might near it. You make a plaster out of that and put it on your head and tie it up. 
then when you take it off it'll take all your hair off with it roots and all and that's the only way to get shed of it your hair never grows back you'll be as bald as a pumpkin till the day you die your whole head will be slick as a peeled onion an old family physician's book described the scald head pretty much the same way Alex described it. This source indicated it was caused by fungi around the roots of the hair and that it attacked people who had no regard for cleanliness. Most interestingly, the medical doctors of that day, mid-1800s, indicated the treatment must include a removal of the crust formed on the scalp and that the most effective means of doing this was by softening it with an oil and removing the hair. One doctor specifically recommended the use of a serrate, a mixture including resin much the same as Alex described. Yeah, that salve will cure any kind of sore. Law, I've made a heap of it. I sent a big beef over to Rogersville the 10th of this month to have it butchered. And I meant to have them save me a couple pounds of tallow to make me some salve. Alex, let me ask you about a few more ailments and you can give me the remedies that you used. Go right ahead. If I know it, I'll tell you. And if I don't, I'll just pass over it. Well, let's start out with rheumatism. You can take a bunch of big red worms and put them in a bottle or a can. And in a day or two, they'll turn into what looks like pure water. They call it red worm oil. Them worms will just disappear and they won't be nothing left but that red worm oil. You take that and rub it on your knees or wherever you're bothered with rheumatism and that'll give you relief. Poke root is awful good and poke berries. They're poison so you don't want to take too much of it. What did you use for the fever? A person with a fever needs to be sweated, and Bonset tea is the best medicine for that. You gather it when it gets in full bloom. You gather the leaves. I've got some of it out there on the porch in a poke now that I gathered over two years ago. You talk about sweating you, it'll do it. It'll break a fever on you when nothing else won't. But it's bitter. It's as bitter as quinine ever dared to be. You take and drink you a saucer full of that before you go to bed, and if you don't sweat, it's because they ain't no sweat about you. Here and in other instances, Alex mentions drinking a saucer full of medicine rather than a cup full. This reference was doubtless prompted by then commonly followed custom of saucering one's coffee instead of drinking it directly from the cup. Mutt, Alex's bachelor son who lives with him, still drinks his coffee that way. The practical reason is that it cools more quickly in a saucer than it does in a cup. Alex, I know that the condition of the blood was considered to be very important and that many patent medicines and bitters were sold for the express purpose of improving the blood. Did you have herbs to improve the blood? As long as your blood's pure, you ain't bothered with no kind of disease. I don't care what it is. You'll hardly ever catch a disease till your blood gets mixed up and run down. That's where diseases start from. Oh, that's the biggest thing I doctored for was your blood. I used to get out and dig nine or ten hours and make some of the best blood medicine ever you saw. I'd get red root, low bee, may apple, black root, yellow dock, burdock, ginseng, golden seal, sarsaparilla. Sarsaparilla is a good blood medicine. It grows in little vines. I've seen the roots just as long as from here to that tree, about 20 feet. Just a little round root and it's yellow and bitter as gall. You can drink all of it you want and it won't hurt you. The more you drink, the better off you are. It'll sure purify your blood. And star root, now that's getting scarce here, star root is, it grows crooked, just like the big grub worm. It'll grow as big around as your fingers. Little fibers grows all around it, and you get a few of them roots and cut them up. It's just as white as it can be. Make a gallon batch, and if you use it right, you'll feel like a new man, certainly. A lot of people don't know it, but rhubarb is a good blood medicine, too. Yes, sir. It'll purify your blood right quick. 
Black root, some people call it Culver's, is good for your blood and a lot of things. I'd go a long ways if I'd know where I could get some of that. It grows up about three feet high and has a little white tassel on it and a little keen leaf. You can take a little of that and make you a tea. And buddy, if your bowels ever give you any trouble, it'll clean you right out. That's one of the best medicines I ever seen for bowel trouble. And it is a good liver medicine. It'll work you quicker than a dose of salts will. Pap used to have black root, but after I got up and left home, the weeds took it. It's got to be took care of. What did you use as a stomach medicine? They ain't no better stomach medicine than golden seal. Years ago, I set out four or five of them golden seal plants up here on the ridge, and every time I'm up there now, I get a pocket full of that root. Do you make a kind of tea from the root? Well, a heap of people does that. Cut the root up fine and put them in water. But I don't take the time to do it that way. I just eat the whole root and swallow it, and that way I make sure I get it all, he laughed. You can have stomach burn and take you a golden seal root and chew and swallow it, and it's all over with. It's good for gonorrhea, too. Now, you wouldn't think about the white oak bark being worth anything. That's the greatest stomach medicine ever was. Just take that inside bark, peel the old rough bark off. Law, what a stomach medicine and blood medicine that is. The white oak has got more medicine in it than anything that grows. Now, you want to get the sap from the north side of the tree. Just take you a knife and peel the north side, and that makes your best medicine. What would you use for a cough? For a cough, you take the bark from a wild cherry tree, boil it down, and make you a syrup. Take you a teaspoonful. Don't take too much. It's high-powered stuff. It'll make you silly and drunk if you take too much. Mountain tea is good for a cough and to sweat you. That's about all that it's fit for, except for flavoring things. You know it has great flavor. In most cases, the remedies Alex prescribed seem to be based on at least a semblance of logic. Occasionally, however, his cure was more akin to superstition. Such was the case with a method of treating whooping cough. You take the child that's got the whooping cough and face him toward the south up against a tree and mark his height. Then you go out and find a sourwood sprout and cut it that same length as the person is high. Hang that sprout up over the door where the child lives, and when it dries out, the whooping cough will be gone. A similar example dealt with stopping nosebleed. There seems to have been more remedies for nosebleed than for almost any other malady. You take a bullet that's been shot out of a gun, bore you a little hole in it, put you a string through it, and tie it around your neck. You won't have no nosebleed as long as you wear that. If you don't believe me, mash your nose and try it. I think I'll take your word for it, but how did you stop the bleeding if you cut yourself? Get you some soot out of the fireplace and put it all around where you're cut, and that'll stop the bleeding. The skin will grow over that and trap that soot, and you can see it for a long time, but it'll finally go away. You've mentioned that whiskey was good for the measles. Were there other treatments for measles? The main thing when you've got the measles is to get them broke out. Measles killed a lot of people when they couldn't get them broke out. Whiskey is about the best for that. It's good for a lot of things. Of course, it'll make you cut a shine if you drink too much of it. Back then, people let their stock run out in the mountains. There was a big high cliff with an overhanging rock up here on the ridge where the sheep would go and lay when it was snowy or during cold freezing rains. They was all kinds of sheep manure there and we would go there and dip that up and boil it and make a tea that was awful good to break out the measles. Did you put anything else in it? No, that was all. Just boil them little sheep balls in water, strain it and drink it. Law, my mother poured, I guess, a pint down me one time. I'll never forget that. After you got the measles broke out, the main thing was to stay out of the cold air. If you ever took a back set, why, you was just a gone sucker most of the time. 
When I was growing up, I remember that a lot of children had what they called sore eyes or the pink eye. Did you ever hear of that? Oh, sore eyes. Lots of people had that. I've seen their eyes swell up, turn red, and it looked like their eyes was growed together. Old yellow matter would run out, and it was terrible. Now, they ain't nothing that beats yellow root. That's the same as golden seal for doctoring sore eyes. You dig the roots and boil them till you get a good thick brew. Then just take you a cloth and bathe your eyes with that every two or three hours. It'll sure cure the sore eyes. I've not heard of that in years and years. The state of West Virginia publishes a most interesting magazine called Golden Seal on the folk culture and customs of the people of that state. According to this periodical, the plant Golden Seal was commonly used by the Indians for treating skin diseases and sore eyes. It was subsequently used by the pioneers for the same purpose, and it was later incorporated in manufactured medicines. It is sometimes used for these purposes even to the present day. In 1909, the magazine pointed out, Golden Seal roots were selling for $1.50 per pound. And in 1975, the price was $50 per pound. So, fascinating look into the medicinal knowledge of Alex Stewart. Again, amazing that this is yet another area where he knows a whole lot about. A lot of those remedies, of course, I'm not familiar with. I don't know anything about. I have heard of some of them over the years, especially the sheep one, uh, using sheep manure to break out measles. I've read of that. I've never known anyone who took it. And when he's talking about golden seal and yellow root, I think those are two different plants, but sometimes they are, the just like lots of stuff in the mountains especially, they get called by the other name interchangeably, kind of. I have lots of yellow root growing along the creek where I live, but I don't know that if there's golden seal, I'm not sure what that is. So this part we read today was kind of hard to read parts of it, kind of like some of those earlier chapters where it was we, he told about the living conditions of people. And you've got to wonder if a lot of these um, illnesses were not related to those, again, those living conditions that they didn't know any better, especially the scald head. Now that sounds terrible, terrible, like it would have been so very painful um, and just horrible to have. Of course, like anything else, I'm so thankful for, for medicine and, and knowledge that we have today. You know, you think of the wonder of the aspirin, but so many other things, you know, that have been they're easily helped or cured today, at least easily get some relief from. In those days was not, because there was just not that option, especially if you didn't know someone like Alex that could help you. So when he's talking about the venereal diseases, it was so bad, it was terrible, and there was just no help really, no no real cure. Thankfully, Alex was, a, was able to help a lot of them. In that first part, when he's talking about that, there was two things that I loved about the language that he used. One of them was um, when he said, don't name it to nobody. The sheriff said, well, don't name it to nobody. So I love that. I, I've only know one person that uses that phrase, name it to me, to mean tell. So he was saying, don't tell it to nobody. So one of my uh, friends I used to work with, she would say that, uh, no, she didn't name it to me, meaning she didn't tell me. So I really loved that one. And then I really loved, I wrote it down, where he's talking to the husband about his bad ailment, and he tells him, don't get out of heart. So Alex was being kind to him, telling him, you know, be encouraged. I'm going to help you. Don't get out of heart. So I really, really liked that part. Along with all that medicinal knowledge that Alex shared, they kind of touched on the, the part about the faith healing, uh, the people that could talk the fire out or stop the blood. And I have some videos about that that I'll link to so you can watch them if you've not watched them. But that's a fascinating uh, subject to think about. And like Wilma Dykeman, I kind of, I totally, not kind of, I totally believe like she did. I always use the example of childbirth, uh, just thinking of me as a mother and then having daughters and they've not had any children yet, not about to have any. But someday if they did, and I think about the pain of labor, and, and then I think about being where I have no medicine and there's no doctors, and how would I give them kind of the... Um, the will and the encouragement and confidence that they could do this, they could get through this pain, you know. Uh, one of the old superstitions like that is for a woman in labor, you should put an axe or a knife under her bed because it will cut her labor pain. Of course, that seems so silly to us, you know. It just seems so silly. Why would you do that? 
But as a mother, when I think about it, if I had no doctor and I had no help and I had nothing to ease their pain, if I really believed that and I put it under there, since they're my daughters, maybe that would just give them a slight bit of comfort, you know, just like Wilma Dykeman was saying, they believed it would work, so it did. So um, I really like that part, how she described it, because that's the way I think. I think a lot of those old things are just, they are, they're silly. But then again, if that's all you had, and, and you had it passed down in your family, like Grandma said, Mother said, now I'm telling you, daughter, this will cut your pain, and it will be easier for you. You can do this. You can bear this child. You can bear this labor pain, you know. So I really, really liked that part. And then when they're talking about taking the medicine in that one part, and John Rice notes that he's talking about saucering the coffee. Um, I love that. Granny, I've seen Granny saucer her coffee before. I had an Aunt Pearl that I can remember. She drank hot tea all the time at Granny Gazzy's. She was one of Gazzy's younger sisters. And I can remember her saucering her tea like that. And it is just to spread it out over a larger uh, area and let it cool and then drink it straight from the saucer. So I, I liked that part. And then on the end there, another language thing, when he's talking about the measles, uh, so that if you didn't get them broke out and you didn't stay out of the cold, out of the cold draft or the wind, uh, that you'd take a back set. Granny has always talked about back sets, and that's one that Matt teases me about because he did not grow up with that, so he'll tease me. But it's true, when you're sick, there's always the chance that you might take a back set and get worse, even though you've been feeling better. So I really enjoyed this part of the book. I wish I had more knowledge about medicinal remedies. I wish I knew more about plants in the wild like Alex did. That's something I definitely wish I knew more and something I hope to, to gain that knowledge and learn more about sometime in the future. So I hope you enjoyed this part of the book. Please leave a comment and let me know what jumped out at you. And as always, I hope you drop back by next Friday because we've got to see what happens to Alex next.